we're gonna look at sustainable versus unsustainable. And not in terms of like the Democrats, you know, current thing they're talking about to get the money to do. No, 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 no. I'm talking about real sustainable versus real unsustainable. So sustainable is a circle and it goes around and around and around. And it might have a little bit coming in and it might have a little bit going out, but to order of magnitude, the input and the output of something that sustains has to be um, like an order of magnitude or three smaller. So think of it as a, a fish tank. So when most people get a fish tank, they buy it and they're impatient and they pack it full of fish and they pack it full of food and all those fish start shitting and there's just piss and shit in the water and there's a bunch of ammonia and then the little bacteria start turning it into, what do they turn it into? Nitrites. And then more bacteria eats that, turns it into nitrates, and then you get a big culmination of nitrates, and then you start going to the fish store and you're buying chemicals and you're trying to neutralize this and that, and you're buying highly porous surfaces like activated uh, charcoal, and you're trying to filter it out, and you're manually scrubbing and cleaning, and nah, dude. That's called unsustainable. That's a high maintenance situation, which is of no interest to us. What we want to do is create a machine or if you let go of it for three months to a year, it continues to operate with minimal input. Now, like, if you think of it in terms of like a company, I'm not talking about throughput, like revenue. I'm talking about how much do you have to get in there and fuck with it, right? So here are a few facts about my fish tanks. And, and I've been keeping, I've been reef keeping for as long or longer than any guy at a store who has like, you know, 25 epic reef tanks, as long or longer than anybody on YouTube except for a few people. There's a few people who've had tanks up for 30 years, but to a T, almost all of those guys have a really high maintenance system because their goal is to make something spectacular because they sell some product or service. They either will keep your reef for you or they'll make you a tank or they'll make you a tool or, you know, so they're showmen and they put a lot of work. Their emphasis is on how pretty it all looks to meet your expectation, what they think you want. But what's really beautiful is something that takes no work and requires no energy and just fucking operates. So, first fact about my fish tanks, I do not have any fish. There are no fish in my fish tanks. I do not keep fish. Fish are filthy, <laughs> grubby, hungry little fuckers that have to eat constantly and shit constantly. They're like 5% efficient, no fish. I keep snails, I keep urchins, I keep anemone, 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 I always say it wrong, but I don't care because I'm doing it so long I can say it wrong if I want. I keep crabs, flat crabs, hermit crabs. I keep amphiopods, bipods. Um, I keep all kinds of weird little bacteria and worms and fan worms and tube worms and wigglers and squigglers. So if you go to a real aquarium that's not set up just to impress kids in where they're doing science, you'll find that it's like, you know, it's a different trip. So, fact two, I never have to clean my glass. There is no glass cleaning in my aquarium. I have two magnets and they haven't moved in so long that things are like laying eggs on them and there's like things hatching off of them. I do not clean the glass. I have no fish, I do not clean the glass. Do not need to, the glass is perfectly clean, the snails do that job. Third fact, I have absolutely no nuisance algae or anything like that on my rocks. My rocks don't have big furry, stringy, gooey, globby algae growing all over the place. Nothing like that. Because the crabs, the small crabs, the medium crabs, the big crabs, they go, the urchins, they go and they eat it and they eat it and they eat it and they eat it and they eat it. All right? Four, I have coralline algae growing profusely and I add nothing. I do not have a calcium reactor. I do not uh, 
uh, do chronic water changes. I don't add part A, part B of purple up. I don't do anything like that. I naturally grow coralline. So coralline's a slow growing algae and to get it to grow, you have to give it a place to grow. And where it grows is where nuisance algae isn't. So if you maintain properly your nuisance algae, then your coralline algae will grow. Yeah, it's gonna strip the water of, uh, of, of all the hard stuff it uses to build. And, and for that, you know, You'll either get a slowdown in growth or you need to do a water change every once in a while or you might need some kind of dripping. I run no additives. I don't pour anything in the tank. I don't drip anything in the tank. I don't have anything like that. I do not run a skimmer. I have no skimmer. In fact, I barely even have a filter. I just have this old canister filter that happens, the, the canister filter is not really for the tank, it's for the humans. It has some activated carbon in it. This is a super high surface area material that when the yellow water goes over it, clear water comes out. So just because people don't like to look at a yellow water tank, which is actually what water looks like. If you go down to the ocean, it ain't clear, dude. It's like green and yellow and funky and fucking nasty. That's what water looks like. But um, my water goes through an activated uh, carbon filter. I've got a, a basic mechanical filter in there just because I look at it every day and I don't like to see yellow. But for the most part, I run no filters. High flow. I've got gigantic DC pumps. Not AC pumps, DC pumps. Gigantic DC pumps in my tank. One of them is just a big fan blade that spins and it's a wave maker and you can tune it. It doesn't matter. You just want it moving the most water possible. You need the water moving at every single part in the tank. If there is a single spot where the water is stagnant, that is where your problems will start. That's where the detritus will collect. That's where things will rot. That'll be a little anaerobic zone. There won't be good airflow, good oxygen there. That's where things go to die. That's not how you do it. Um, I run under the cabinet big DC pumps that are also variable power, but I have them turn up all the way and they're closed loop. They just, they're all big ass pipes, like inch and a half. I just suck in water through a coarse filter and I blow it right back in the tank. And in this case, I happen to run it through a chiller. So I have a chiller, a big one, like half horsepower and bigger is better. And it, putting it in the basement or down uh, under the house is better. You want it, you don't want it under the cabinet breathing its own hot air. It's noisy, it's loud, it's obnoxious. You gotta, you gotta be able to go through the floor, through the walls. Do not be scared. <laughs> You're gonna be punching holes. Um, in times past, I've had really complicated systems, but what I'm doing right now is making a simple system. Uh, I do not use fan cooling. Fan cooling causes an incredible, I do on one of my tanks, and that one's very high maintenance. Remember the point of this, how do you make a zero maintenance machine? How do you make a self-sustaining machine that can run for three months to a year? I do not run fans uh, on my water because that causes too much evaporation and too much top off. Now if I had an auto top off, uh, I would consider putting, you enclose the top of the tank to basically like the attic, and you suck the air out of the, the hot top surface area, you know, and you have a fan blowing across that surface area to agitate it, and then you evacuate that moisture out of the living space, because you don't want it in the living space, it sucks. And then you have to have a fresh air intake that, you know, will be warm or cold, depending on what you're trying to do. I would be sucking mine up from the bottom of the house because the goal is to keep the, the tank below 63 degrees. Maybe 52, maybe 58, maybe 63. It all depends on, on what you're trying to do and how fast you want it to happen. The colder you keep a tank, the slower things go. The warmer you keep the tank, the riskier it is, but the faster things happen. So if you keep a tank at 52 degrees F, it's like time stops, dude. It's cold. <laughs> Not much happens. But if you keep a tank at 63, you'll think you'll, things happen fast, dude. It's scary. Like in a matter of three days, you know, you can get an outbreak of something or things are more active, more rascally. Things, their metabolism moves faster. So if you're going to leave something alone for a really long time, if your goal is just to have it sustained, you want to run it colder. If your goal is to grow something, to reproduce something, to breed something, then you probably want it a little bit warmer. Um, We've spent thousands and thousands and thousands of hours combing 
the reefs and feeling the water temperatures and seeing, you know, the, the, the ebb and flow of the tide and, and how the temperatures change. So anyone who says you got to keep a steady temperature for your fucking reef creatures is a retard, dude. There is nothing steady in any way, shape, or form about the life of a reef crit critter in like a foot of water. Anything that you can like go down there and look at from the rocks or you can go down there and touch, Dude, they're seeing phenomenal swings and they react to those swings because they know if they get caught in the hot water, they're gonna get hotter and hotter and hotter till a seagull comes down there and eats their legs off of them. So you're gonna find that the animals respond to the water, the temperature. Now, do I run bubblers or anything like that? No, I don't need to. When you turn your water over, your, your surface area at the top of the tank is where your gas exchange occurs. And so if you box in the top of your tank for aesthetics, you get stale air in there. So you're not gonna get your oxygen exchange. So I run an open top. I run LED lights, and the stronger you run your lights, the, the faster things will happen. The more nuisance algae will grow, the more other stuff will grow. Um, I run pretty low power LED lights because around here the water is pretty murky. Not that much light gets down there. Um, Anemone, anemone, I don't care how people say it. I say anemone, that's how I say it. I don't care. I have grown more anemones than anybody who knows how to say anemone. I have grown anemones this big, they can't even fit in the picture, that have split like nine times. Like, I know everything about anemones, that's how I say it, I don't care. Um, if you feed them a lot, then they will grow very fast and then they'll either split, depending on your water quality. If your water quality and environment is poor, they'll keep splitting and splitting and splitting. If your water quality is good, they'll get bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's one of your indicators. So the goal is not to maximize bio load for starters. That's an advanced goal. And that involves a different skill set. Like, if my goal was to put 25 Dungeness crabs in a 150 gallon tank, I could do that. The first thing I would do, I would make it very cold to slow down their metabolism. I would have a huge bubbler doing a huge gas exchange in the tank. I would keep it dark so that they all just rest. Like a crab will sit there and rest for like a month, dude. They can slow down and they can speed up. Like an urchin can go into like hibernation for like a fucking decade, dude. These things do not operate like humans. They're different. Um, so I want to eventually breed crabs, but that's a multi-year process. And it's totally, it's, it's never gonna be feasible, right? It'll never be economically viable. The way you breed crabs is with a body of water of like a million gallons, all right? That's, that's naturally, you basically net off a part of the ocean, right? And, let, and then just, tra it's basically trapping. So they're stuck in a certain area and they just fuck and fuck and fuck and make more crabs. What I want to do is keep crabs. I want to keep them for a day or a week or a month or several months so that I still have crabs when it's off season. A crab is far more tasty and far more valuable off season. So I'll be there in about a year. I'm gonna go out during crabbing season when it's legal to do so. I'm going to catch legal crabs that are of the minimum size and the correct sex using the approved traps that are licensed. I'm going to stockpile those, and I'm going to eat them when I please. Now, to get there, we're going to have many adventures where we're teaching kids how to do it. A nine-year-old and like a three-month-year-old. How, how do you farm, right? It's farming. How do you farm animals? And my particular flavor of farming animals is sea animals, cold water specifically. So if you want a tank to be able to sit for a year, first you don't want to pay the electric bill. So you're gonna set up some solar panels that are like double or triple what your need is, and an MPPT for those that's very reliable and run conservatively. And a stack of batteries that can run the tank for three days. The whole tank, the pumps, the uh, the chillers, the lights.
lights, everything for three days. Um, an uplink that tells you if something has gone terribly wrong so that you can react to it. And um, it's about backups, man. Like stages of backups. Like if the shit hits the fan, the one thing that must happen is the pumps must keep spraying. You don't need the lights. You don't need the filters. You might not even need the chiller in the winter, but you must have the water moving. You must have the pumps. So you set up a series of redundant systems that fail, that cascade. You know, you want to be able to run your pumps for like a month. And the chiller has to be able to kick on and hold it below a sane temperature. Like, the warmest you can realistically run cold water critters is like 63 or 64 degrees. If you start getting up to like 66, it's just too warm. Just bad stuff happens. It's not their natural environment. Like 63 is like a real 64 upper cap. Um, and, and I would say 52 is kind of a lower, unless you're going with some kind of real, you know, exotic deep sea cold critters where it, it actually is, you know, like 48 degrees and, you know, these things grow, but these things grow like a millimeter every 10 years, right? So if you want to watch that happen, just set a webcam up down in the ocean <laughs> or go down there once every five years and check it out. Um, I like things that grow a little faster than that. So you got to set up a solar system. Uh, for auto top off, you gotta have a, a means to top off fresh water that is highly reliable. So that means uh, multiple uh, redundant systems, probably three. So you can you can tolerate not one failure, at least two failures, and ideally you can tolerate three failures. Like at the, it's a whole art and science to understanding how to set up a redundant protection that isn't fouled through time. Like if you're like, oh, I'm gonna put a toilet float on the end. Well, if you're constantly pouring water over this, you know, 24 hours a day for months and months and months and months, all kinds of little calcium buildups happen, salt buildups happen, um, uh, the, the tiny stray currents in the water uh, eat away the metal and things fuse and it just doesn't work. So you need fundamentally, you know, like if you have um, like a like a, a surge device, anything like that, you have to fundamentally build things that will not clog with algae, will not uh, bind up. So stray currents. It's incredibly important that you don't use AC devices in your tank, and that's because they leak. It's a very high voltage, and you get leakage stray current, and that leakage current runs around through everything and looks for a, a way back to ground. And that's what rapidly degrades your equipment and um, dissolves metals into different crystals and just fucks everything up. So you only use low voltage DC equipment and wherever possible, you use external pumps that are completely and totally magnetically isolated from the water flow. Like my water flow goes through my DC pumps. Now this DC pump's rated to be dropped in the water, but I do not drop it in the water. I keep it under the tank and it's nothing but um, a spinning, uh, uh, it's not spinning. It just has a coil of, of magnets or a coil. It has windings around the edges, like a hub motor, and it goes da 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 And then the impeller is a magnet, and the impeller steps. It's a stepper motor. And there's absolutely no contact between the water and the, the DC electronics. And even if there was, it would just be DC stray. It would be very small. And, uh, yeah, so you don't put direct drive AC stuff in your tank because it will cause things to rapidly degrade. For your lights, they've got to be LED, zero maintenance. You cannot run like halides. They put off too much heat, they're too inefficient, they're, they're unreliable, they have to be changed out on the cycle. You don't want anything like that. You don't want to run a skimmer because even if you put an auto cleaner on the skimmer, it's changing over time. The, the neck and cup are filling with goo and it's depositing and depositing and it's changing over time and it's getting smaller and smaller. You can't, uh oh, storage low. You cannot run a mechanical filter because it clogs up. So the end of the story is, is what you do is you run a live filter. You run a macro algae filter. This is a filter that is growing and alive in a predator free zone and you get a continuous cycle. Unfortunately, I gotta cut it short because I'm out of memory on the phone.